there's never been a better time to have Sirius XM with even more exclusive content with over 150 channels in your vehicle, including the widest, deepest variety of music ad-free. Root for your team. Get news. Listen to whatever makes you laugh. And hear all about your favorite stars. Your Platinum Plan offer includes more than ever before to enjoy online, on your phone, or at home. Create your own ad-free, personalized stations powered by Pandora. Hear ad-free extra channels filled with music and enjoy a favorite shows with Sirius XM Video. Thousands of hours of shows and performances on demand. What you love is on now. In the world of sound reproduction, there are few, if any, global brands that have the repertoire and longevity that today's feature brand does. Of course, we're talking about Sony and more specifically, Sony Mobile ES audio file grade equipment. We've got Chris Buell in the studio with today. With us today. This is going to be a fun one. This is CMA Connected presented by Sirius XM, Sony Mobile ES, and it starts now. What's going on, everybody? And thanks for tuning in to another CMA Connected presented by Sirius XM. I'm your host, Ben Wu. And today on CMA Connected, we are going one on one with a brand that means so much to so many of us. And it really depends what age you are, because literally they've been around that long and have innovated and produced products that have infiltrated our lives in such deep ways. It's sometimes you don't even know whether it's a you know, a dream machine, alarm clock radio, or a Walkman for some of our older guys, or pro sound and cinematic sound, or sound recordings and music contracts, or car audio, we're talking Sony. And Sony has been there from the get-go. And I'll tell you what, before we even bring Chris on, you know, Mobile ES, for those of you who are, are, are recognize that brand, you know, has been a staple within Sony for many years, especially in the audiophiles type uh, sound. Uh, to see that they are still innovating brand new product for us here in the mobile electronics industry certainly tickles this host because it's great to see that we have such a, a, a huge brand that's still interested in our category and continues to innovate. So that's what I'll say about that. But I, for one, am very interested to dive deep and get nerdy with our specialist today. Let's bring him in. His name is Chris Bula, and he's the Global Product Training Manager for Sony Car Audio. Hey, Ben. Mr. Bula, how are you today? I'm doing great, but I have nothing left to train on. You said everything. I know, I know. I, I stole your thunder. It's what I do. But let's be honest. Um, when we had our preamble to today's session, you know, I told you, I said, Chris, we don't need to skip the points on this one. We don't need the Coles notes. We need Chris Bula unleashed, untethered, going deeper than just what the, you know, the, the bullet point is. We need to know because... This is our chance to geek out, you know. Is everybody tuning into the audio file sessions? Probably not. We don't care because we're only catering to those that really care about this higher end stuff. And we're happy that you're here with us today to share with us a couple of details, I would say. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with your audience. It's always fun to get on these because uh, we're able to kind of level with uh, those, the audience that's listening and kind of give them a lot of cool detail about the product. Uh, that we don't usually kind of get to tell people about, right? So putting stuff on a website or putting stuff out in an email is is okay uh, to some people, but you don't really get to hear it, you know, from the horse's We, we mouth. want it's the so story, terrible. like the yeah. organic, like how did it come about? Why were certain decisions made? Why is that button the way it is? Or why did you choose, you know, whatever <laughs> part? And I think that's what we're going to achieve today. Now, you know, Sony Mobile ES, like I said, you know, I come from a little bit of a two-channel background as well. So it means a lot to me. Just seeing that yellow square is like, wow, that's cool that Sony takes the time, puts some sort of elite team together to say, hey, we need to come up with these special products. Not that we don't have great products already, but we want, you know, something a little more special uh, for this group of enthusiasts. And, and I feel that's what Mobile ES does for me anyways, as an enthusiast. You, you raise a, a very interesting point there and something that uh, we kind of really took to heart. We already make really good product. Um, you know, our core line products are spectacular. They're very reliable. Uh, they sound great, all that good stuff. One of the biggest uh, kind of, not an obstacle, kind of the hurdle we had to get over 
was trying to create new product with this higher end ish mobile ES moniker on top of it that didn't negate the work we'd already done on our core line products, right? So um, it was really important to us that we not only protected our current core line, but also were able to achieve this higher end status with the mobile ES product. Amazing. So, uh... I guess the big burning question for today's session, and uh, obviously you have a great presentation we're going to go through in detail. So tune in for that. Stay tuned in for that. Take out your notes. If you're wondering, you know, what's all the buzz about mobile ES, you're about to find out today for real. But I guess the burning question is, you know, what makes mobile ES, Sony mobile ES products audiophile grade? I think that's going to be the, our, our, the gist of our conversation today. So I'm going to start with probably a topic that, uh, or a, a statement that, uh, some people listening may not like, right? And I think audiophile is a little overused in the industry. I think that's a very vague uh, term and it can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, right? So uh, I think audiophile grade um, is a cool term. I'm not quite sure there's a, like a typical definition for it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we've built really good sound product not just in the car side but on the home side movie theater side all that good stuff for a very long time so to say that sony's audiophile grade we'd naturally touch some audiophiles in those different categories right you know through our products uh so i think you could safely say that i think that one of the most important things to kind of really know about sony is that uh we're the only brand that in this industry in the car audio industry we're the only ones that have our own music studios. We're the only one that have our own recording artists. Uh, we have we have an inherent responsibility to make sure that we are recreating sound in a way that is as accurate as possible to what the artist or the, the mastering studio uh, wanted to achieve with it. You know, so I think, you know, not that anybody else's product is any different, you know, because of that factor. But I think that we take it so seriously that we are keeping sound as accurate as possible. You know, might, might I say that it feels to me like there is an added layer of responsibility, burden. I don't know what the term is that comes along with all those things that you mentioned, Chris. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, it's definitely not a burden. I think it's uh, I think it's a goal, right? I think mm -hmm. it's um, it's a, an achievement that we want to create uh, for ourselves that we're able to accomplish pretty well. Uh, I think that the accuracy, especially in this mobile ES lineup from start to finish from the source unit all the way through the speakers, uh, I think we are able to achieve uh, a sound accuracy and reproduction standard that is unrivaled in the industry um, only because we have the, like the full you know path from source unit all the way through the speakers, right? Mm -hmm. we, we can actually now fulfill every portion of that audio stream. There's a lot of really good companies, uh, especially in this audiophile category that create really good products in certain parts of it right processors um you know especially on the dsp side speakers amplifiers there's a lot of really good products out there but we're one of the very few that can do it from start to finish right you really control and that i think that's important mm -hmm. you know um all right well you kind of went there so why don't you give us the layout for those who don't know or maybe not up to date uh Everybody, I think, at this point, whoever was going to tune into this, knows about the 9500ES, knows about the source unit. So I know we're going to talk about that. But what's on the menu today? What are we going over? Yeah, so we're going to talk about the, the 9500ES. We're going to talk about technology and kind of the engineering, because we have some pretty astounding engineers in our, uh, uh, in our uh, offices in Japan that really put together some excellent product, not just on the source unit side. That's what everybody knows Sony for is, hey, we're a radio company. But we also have done that same type of engineering and, and technology um, kind of implementation with our amplifiers. And then we're able to carry that through our speakers as well, keeping that sound as accurate as possible all the way through. Amazing. So we're going to get it step by step, piece by piece, I guess, from source to output. This uh, seems like the, the menu today. Uh, right. All right. You mentioned it. XAV 9500ES. We're going to start this presentation with a video to kind of set the stage. And when we come back, we'll set you up with your presentation and uh, we'll take it from there. How about Great. that? Let's go.
Wow, what a machine. I never get sick of seeing all those fancy terms that I don't really know what they mean, but I'm hoping that you can, you know, uh, sort that out for us today, Chris. So let's well, go like ahead. Like I said, between you and the video, my training's done. So there we go. <laughs> well, no, we need you to kind of explain to us what, you know, those special capacitors or copolymer, whatchamacallits are. So we're going right to get on. in there. We're going to get in there. Let's go ahead and bring up your presentation and sure. uh, get you all set up. Awesome. Very cool. I almost forget that it has cool features like Sirius XM and Maestro as well. I mean, I know that's not really what we're talking about today, but it's great to have those features built in. That was my we support that. Sirius XM because they're the best satellite radio company out there. So Imagine. Imagine that. <laughs> we think so, too. We think so, too. All right. Here you go, Chris. Cool. Take it away. Thanks, buddy. All right. So diving into ES, this was a big deal um, for us. I think there was, um, I think the original request to bring ES back into the industry started probably five, maybe almost six years ago now. Uh, and initially, Japan was just not at all interested, right? So it was pretty interesting. But, um, you know, after uh, a couple of years of us kind of asking the question, can we do this? Uh, the, the discussions got more serious, right? Like, could we do this? Um, is there a market for this? Uh, how do we do this properly? without um, kind of taking away from our core lineup. How do we do that? How do we add some features, some specifications that aren't realized already with those other products? So there was a lot of, uh, on the business side, a lot of uh, thought process on the product planning side, a lot of the engineering side that we had to kind of just dive in feet first. And one of the things we did is we just kind of blew everything up and started from scratch, right? So when designing the head unit, when designing the speakers, the amplifiers, the subs, we just kind of started over. And one of the things that um, I know the Sony tech team uh, on the SNA side did was we really kind of put the technician as one of the, the primary, you know, kind of things we had to think about, like how easy was this stuff to install? Uh, why was it important to do certain things on these products uh, to make them worthwhile to be in the shop, right? So. All of that being said, we finally were able to uh, bring out some products. We began that effort last May uh, in 2021 uh, with our speaker launch. And uh, later in the year, I think it was October, November, when we finally launched the 9500ES. Uh, and then just a, a couple months ago, we finally released our new amplifiers in the ES lineup. So we are now at this point able to provide a signal from the source unit through amplifiers, through speakers and subwoofers uh, as a complete audio system uh, in the mobile ES system. So really cool stuff for sure. But first things first, let's kind of talk about the mobile ES uh, XAV 9500ES. So Ben, you mentioned that, um, you know, you couldn't stop kind of just, you know, thinking about this head unit and all the cool features it has. Uh, it's really cool to have somebody like yourself who's seen a lot of different products say something like that, right? It means we've hit uh, on a couple key points. One is the feature set. Uh, people are expecting a lot of creature comforts in a deck nowadays, right? Uh, Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, all that good stuff. But when we take it to the next level, like what does Mobile ES mean? What does Sony mean in terms of sound reproduction? We really want to make sure that we're kind of getting everything perfect inside the unit right so everybody can put kind of a pretty face on a head unit uh, bigger displays are always better nowadays it seems like uh flashy swimming dolphins racing cars all that good stuff yay right uh, but inside the unit is where everything is created okay or reproduced and we really spent a lot of time making sure that the sony guts if you will were sony worthy and sony mobile es worthy so to take a peek inside the the head unit here we want to kind of show you guys how we divided up this chassis some of you who may have had some experience in the past with the uh the older rsx gs9 which uh kind of paved the way to begin high-res audio being uh brought into the vehicle uh five six seven years ago uh, that that had a similar chassis design. It separated uh, the analog and digital components inside that chassis to prevent any radiated noise between those components. So we have all those digital components for things like Sirius XM, 
Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, the uh, LDAC Bluetooth chip, all that good stuff. But we also have a premium class AV amplifier inside this head unit, right? So those make very noisy neighbors. We've separated all of those analog and digital components completely, shielded them from each other. And then we have an EMI uh, shielded chassis that all of these components go into. So there's really no radiated noise that can get into the chassis and no radiated noise between the components inside it. Uh, we even went to the, the extra level of creating a harness on the back. Um, so there was no contamination by putting the RCA plugs on the back of the chassis itself, where you might have some of that cross interference between those components. So a lot of engineering, a lot of expertise went into designing this head unit just to make sure it was the best possible thing in the, in the head unit. So uh, here's a, a bit of a kind of a spec chart, if you will. This is something that uh, we will share with anybody that's out there. Uh, but the frequency response is 5 hertz to 80 kilohertz. Uh, signal to noise ratio on the pre outs 115 dBA. Um, it's A-rated. Uh, the signal to noise on the speaker outputs is 91. Uh, if you look at the total harmonic distortion on the line output and the speaker output, we're, we're talking like infinitesimal, like small amounts. This is one of the best sounding head units ever produced. And this chart proves it. These are reproducible, measurable. You can prove these yourselves, no problem at all. But this is really cool stuff for kind of the audio file, if you will, to know. Okay. One of the reasons uh, the head unit sounds so good and is so capable on the sound processing side is the level of the components that are on the board itself. So I, I think, Ben, you termed these the whatchamacallits on the board, right? So the, these are actually super important for us to have on this board. These uh, these caps, uh, you know, everything that's, that's built into this, they provide a solid voltage signal for that sound processor. Uh, that sound processor, by the way, uh, and the DAC itself reduce all jitter to almost zero. So you have none of that uh, cross contamination there on the signals. The the AB amplifier that's built in. Some of the components used here are sourced from our home theater units. Uh, very high end uh, pieces that are put onto this board itself, just to deliver the the highest possible sound reproduction in a head unit. Next up is this ESS uh, 9080Q 32-bit DAC sound chip. This is pretty amazing stuff. So, you know, COVID kind of locked things down in the industry for a while, uh, especially on a design and production standpoint. Uh, but one of the things it afforded us to be able to do was uh, with the, the delay of the launch of this head unit, we were able to take advantage of getting the latest and greatest chip uh, from this manufacturer into our unit. So this ESS 9080Q is the latest and greatest uh, car audio sound processing chip that's in a board. We're the only ones that use an outboard sound processing chip. Uh, so I like to use the analogy, if you're building a computer, you probably want an outboard uh, graphics card um, that has its own dedicated RAM, its own dedicated uh, you know inputs, outputs, all that good stuff. And I think that we have designed this in a similar fashion where we have this outboard sound processing chip that allows us to do some greater things with that sound reproduction. Of course, we can play any high-res audio file that there is, um, so including all the way up to the DSD uh, files as well. Um, we will reproduce those in a 192.24 output, uh, which is, I think, matched by only a couple competitors in the industry. Along with that sound chip, we have a lot of built-in sound processing on top of that. So we do have a built-in six channel time alignment. Uh, this allows you to dial in the distance to the drivers. This is a pretty rudimentary system. Um, you're basically just setting the time delay for that um, or that delay for the for the signal uh, to kind of get that sound stage set up properly. We do have some presets built in, which actually do a pretty good job of uh, getting you close to where you need to be. Then you can kind of custom dial it in from there. We do have a parametric EQ that's built in, uh, of course, and a graphic EQ. Of course, everything is very easy to adjust. Uh, you can drag and drop everything visually on that large 10.1 inch screen. Um, it's actually pretty easy to use for sure. I can tell you from my own personal standpoint, 
uh, things like the EQ or the subwoofer level control. Um, you can highlight the, the frequency to just tap on that icon and then use the arrow that's shown on that screen up and down. It gives you a more finite control uh, of that dial. I've got big sausage fingers. So when I move that up, it's going three or six dB up at a time. We have two, we have 12 dB uh, positive or negative reference on these, uh, on these bands, right? So keep that in mind. You have that the parametric with the graphic on top of it. So you could essentially get up to a 24 dB uh, either boost or uh, retention on that signal. It's, it's very interesting. One of the important things to know if you're setting this up is if you set the parametric EQ and then set the graphic EQ on top of that, uh, if you go and readjust the parametric EQ, it will flatten out your graphic EQ. We do that as a safety precaution because of that 12 dB gain possibility on uh, the parametric EQ plus the possible 12 dB gain on the graphic EQ. You could get into some trouble if you're boosting those uh, successively on top of each other. So again, if you uh, adjust that parametric EQ, uh, we will flatten out your graphic EQ and you'll have to reset that. Okay. So one of the cool things that we offer on our uh, EQs is the ability to go one tenth of a number uh, in the adjustment. So some of the competitors will go up one full number at a time. And when I say competitors, I mean talk. I'm talking on the head unit side. Processors will allow you to, to adjust a little bit more finite like this. But in a head unit, we go 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, uh, where at some of the competitors will go one, two, three. Uh, that's especially important when you're setting up a parametric EQ to help overcome some nuances in the vehicle or in the sound system that you've installed. Uh, those finite controls kind of help you tune it a little bit better. It's kind of the difference between Captain Caveman tuning or Van Gogh painting a little bit better of a picture, right? So really cool stuff there. Let's talk about amplifiers real quick. This is, uh, this is pretty awesome stuff here. So we took the same sound quality and the same uh, sound reproduction uh, kind of all those aspects that we created with the 9500, and we wanted to be able to push those through these amplifiers with the same high quality, okay? So no expense or engineering detail was spared when designing these, but your customers are super concerned about power. Uh, it's kind of the dollars versus watts uh, scenario. So how much are they getting for that money that they're spending, right? So if start if we start at the bottom here on this screen, we've got the XM1ES. That's a CTA rated 600 watts RMS at 4 ohm, 1,000 watts uh, at 2 ohm. We've got an XM4ES, which is 100 watts by 4 at 4 ohm and 165 watts by 4 at 2 ohm. And then you can bridge those four channels down into two channels at a 4 ohm load for 330 watts RMS. And then that XM5ES is kind of the darling of the bunch. This has all of the same power output as the 4ES on the four channels. And then about 75% of that 1ES. So you've got 450 watts at 4 ohm on the sub output and 750 watts RMS at 2 ohm on, this, on the sub output. So really a lot of power for the dollars being spent. Next up, here's just another kind of quick peek at an engineering uh, detail that we've put into these amplifiers. There's a lot of uh, really good strategy used on the board design. We've used a lot of good, uh, just, you know, good sound principles when designing the amplifiers themselves. But something as small as the resonance of the amplifier itself, we, our engineers took the time to make sure that the peak for this was shifted outside of the normal vehicle vibration, which can range anywhere from about 10 to 150 hertz while you're driving down the road. We don't want that radiated sound to enter your audio system at all. Okay. So one of these little details like this, and there's a lot of them built into our products, uh, can make the difference when you're trying to recreate that high-end audio system. So on the amplifiers, we wanted to make sure that on the technician side, these were extremely easy to set up and install. So on the settings side, you've got access to uh, you know both your your remote turn on or signal sense, of course, high or low voltage. These can accept up to 16 volts um, on a, uh, a high input signal. 
and you've got a bunch of different input modes. You've got, um, I'll, I'll talk about those in a little bit uh, on another slide here, but a lot, a lot of input modes to kind of overcome using a pretty simple uh, uh, LOC adapter or some other type of basic summing device or something like that. Uh, you've got a lot of range and flexibility on the crossovers and filters on these amplifiers. So you can do, you can turn them off if you're running, uh, you know, from a processor or something like that, high pass, low pass, or even a band pass on the four channels on the 4ES or 5ES. Uh, and then of course you have a low pass and a subsonic uh, on the uh, 1ES, of course. Now on the input side, we wanted to make sure that we had as much flexibility as possible when setting up a new system. So the standard four channel on the top left is probably 80 or 90% of your installs, right? So this is a straight four channel input into the amplifier and standard four channel output, no big deal. Uh, the one channel mono, this might be an instance where uh, you've got a, a very high end vehicle with a lot of speakers. Uh, some of the new Cadillacs have 30 plus speakers in them. Uh, and some technicians might use a single four channel amp uh, to recreate that one quarter of the car. So you'd use that right front signal, for instance, from your either either your radio or your processor into uh, that one channel mono output and get that output for all of the speakers powered off that amplifier. A two channel stereo, which is the third one down on the left, uh, is prob probably used when you're using like a lower end source unit or more likely when you're adding a large system to a vehicle and you've got maybe a six or eight channel processor and you're simply running out of channels, right? So you can use that two channel stereo left and right input to power all four of the outputs on the amplifier. And then we've got a summed four channel stereo input, which is kind of unique. Uh, we've got uh, the ability to sum the, the left and the right signals, your one plus three and your two plus four inputs to create a stereo left and right output. So this might be uh, useful in some vehicles that have multiple speakers up front, especially ones that have different uh, uh, output in them from the factory uh, system. So maybe Bluetooth uh, output on the dash speakers in a vehicle, uh, or maybe a frequency difference between the door speakers and the tweeters on the dash, something like that, where you could combine those two separate uh, channels uh, into the amplifier itself and then recreate that channel going out. On the subwoofer side, we gave you the same type of flexibility. So a standard one channel uh, input, this might be used on any of our decks besides the 9500, which has two. Uh, a two channel five plus six summed, a two channel one plus two summed on the five channel, and a two channel three plus four summed on the five channel. That gives you the flexibility to determine which of those channels is providing you the subwoofer input for control of that subwoofer output. Of course, the 1ES uh, is a little bit different on the subwoofer input. You've got a 1, a single mono, or a 1 plus 2 summed input on that one. And then the output side, we gave you the same type of flexibility. So we have a standard throughput, which is your channels 1 and 2 on any of the amplifiers that goes back out to the output. Uh, you've got a stereo mode. on This is on the 4ES and the 5ES, where you'd have the, uh, the 1 plus 3, 2 plus 4 uh, combined left and right stereo output going out of the two RCA outputs on the amplifier. That will allow you to, to use that same setup uh, with something downstream from that original amplifier. And then you've got the ability to sum all four of those channels internally in the amplifier to provide that full spectrum out to another device downline. That might be used rarely. Uh, the through and the stereo are probably your more common ones to be used. And then last but not least, a lot of engineering went into the speakers. So this is kind of the, the end result, right? So you can have a great source unit, you can have great amplifiers, but if you've got speakers that just kind of aren't up to the task, uh, you're kind of left hanging, right? So we spent a lot of time making sure that the speakers stayed cool. We've got a vented motor frame and structure that cools the entire uh, motor itself as the speaker plays back. Uh, on the left side of the screen there, you'll see our notched edge surround. What those notches do in that surround is they keep that cone centered as it moves up and down. And that lightweight cone is about 10 times as rigid as our previous generations of that cone. So very cool, uh, easy way to make sure the sound is accurately reproduced. 
And now on the right hand side, you'll see an aluminum shorting ring. What that does is it re reduces the magnetic flux as the speaker is playing back. This is especially useful through your mid range and some of the vocal uh, reproduction of that speaker. Uh, you'll notice that these speakers are much clearer than some of the comp uh, competitors that don't have this type of feature. Uh, it reduces any possibility of distortion uh, in those mid frequencies. Well, with that, Ben, I think I'm kind of through on some of those kind of techie features. So I'd love to to chat with you about some of the questions you've got. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. First off, uh, thank you so much for such a professional presentation. I would expect no <laughs> less. Um, yeah. Okay. Where do I start? Let's start from the beginning of all this and something that you didn't mention, but I, I'm going to mention because I think it's important that we, we mention it and that we discuss it. Uh, Japanese company, right? Sony, obviously. Uh, but you, Chris Bula, were hands-on involved in some of the R&D development of these mobile ES products. Can you give us a little bit more insight on that story? Yeah, I think um, it, not just me, but our, our whole SNA team was given the chance uh, a few years back to start giving a lot of really good input to the design of the new products, right? And um, I've been kind of the point man uh, for that, you know, especially with the mobile ES design, uh, you know, these new products. Uh, I work hand in hand with the product planners and give feedback to the engineers when necessary. Uh, about things that have to be included with the product, things that have to be incorporated into the product for the installation side of things, um, or just the reasons behind it. It's helpful for the engineers and the product planners to really understand how the product's being used. And with us and our expertise here uh, in the States on how to apply these products to a vehicle, um, that's immeasurable when it comes to providing that feedback back to the engineering team. So uh, they're able to kind of get a hands-on feel without actually doing a hands-on experience, right? Um, and it's really cool, and I, I feel very uh, humbled to be part of that process. It's very fun. Well, it's it's super unique because, like I said, Japanese company. But you look at technologies that you've incorporated. Let's start with the 9500 ES. I pointed out before, you know, Maestro. That's a North American-based technology group. Right. So that's that's a lot of local conversation, trying to figure out, you know, what features can we include or whatnot when we're you know building out a new platform like that. Then you look at Sirius XM, again, a North American base. So there's a lot of local influence that probably wouldn't happen if they didn't have that on the you know boots on the ground type of um, internal team. Right. So that did that you were uh, so involved in. And then the other side, I look at the amplifiers and obviously it's evident, you know, OEM integration, summing. Uh, these are all key things. It's going to be hard to sell an amplifier. I don't care how high end it is, if you can't get the signal or get it in a car. I mean, and this this kind of leads me right to this whole question that I asked in the beginning of the show. You know, is it audiophile great? Yes, but we have to define what that means, especially in a car environment. I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, so like I said, we've built great product for a long time, and you know, are we audiophile great? I think that's a a weird term um but i mean yeah i mean we can reproduce audio as it's meant to be so it's you know if there's an audio file that's that wants the sound to not sound like it was meant to be then we can't do that right but, but we're going to do it exactly how it was meant to be and i think the the thing that we're able to do with this product and our current product planning and engin engineering team is able to put audio file grade products quote unquote uh, into the hands of many and make them applicable to the vehicles we're installing them in. I think that's just as important, right? Anybody can build a three foot long amplifier. That sounds awesome, but you're going to put it in three cars, right? And that's not important. Anybody can build a $50,000 audio system, but where's the customer for that, right? So we have to be able to build product that's affordable, product that's applicable, Right. And I think those things are very important. Oh, man, you nailed something there. I was just going to say affordable. You know, we're looking at that 9500 is are arguably one of the best sounding, you know, um, source units in the market right now. But it's not out of reach from a, a, a MSRP standpoint. You know what I mean? Like we're not talking about a five thousand dollar source unit. This is something that is well within reach for many who care and want something a level up. So I think that was very, very uh, interesting that Sony incorporated that into the pricing of everything as well. Um, but we have to make sense. We have to be able to sell yes, the product. We have to, to be able to sell it. Building it right? yeah. And dealers got to have enough, you know, confidence to be able to stock it, to sell it. And, uh, and, and I think you've done that. Um, 
let's talk about some geeky stuff. So ESS chip, you've mentioned it before in a previous uh, presentation, and I kind of hung, kind of put that on, pinned it, and said, oh, let's see who else comes up with this ESS chip thing that Chris is so proud of and talking about. Well, some time has passed, Chris, and I haven't seen that ESS chip come up anywhere in dialogue. So what is the deal? Is this like an exclusive deal? Like, why is it that only Sony is using this ESS chip? It's not exclusive to us. I mean, I think anybody could buy it if they wanted to. Um, but do they? Right. I mean, I don't I don't know. Um, it's not in all of our products. Right. It's only in our ninety five hundred uh, ES flagship. So uh, it's not necessarily meant for the masses. The cost of that chip is high, um, but the capability is is worth it. Right. And when you're trying to produce a flagship, um, you know, high end audio source unit. Uh, you have to use the high end, you know, parts to go with it. Right. You can't just kind of, um, you know, go halfway. And I think it's important. Right. If you're building a race car, you, you can't put uh, can't put a Hyundai Elantra engine in it. Right. You know, you're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to beef up the internals and get things right. And I think that's what we've done with that 9500 ES. You know, fair enough. Fair enough. Overbuilt. Overbuilt. Mm -hmm. um, now, a couple of those whatchamacallits and gizmos and gadgets. So all that for me. And, 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 you know, I will look back at this presentation, really dive in a little bit further, but like the care and the and the, the decisions made, you know, from from the components to the isolation of the different stages within the chassis. And the one that blew me away the most, because, again, another thing that I've never heard come up in any dialogue that I've had. And I get a, I have a lot of dialogue, as you can imagine, um, the whole attention to chassis resonance and damping. Like, was that, is that something that Sony's been doing for a while now? Or is that, did that just show up with the 9500ES or amps or whatever else um, that applies? I think this is the, uh, this is the second time we've applied it to a source unit. So the RSX GS9 had the same type of uh, design theory behind the chassis. So the 9500 is the second source unit. Uh, this is the first application in amplifiers to use this. Um, and I think, listen, there's a lot of really, really good companies out there um, that have really good design teams and really good engineering teams. But when you when you have the power and the weight and the size of Sony, you've got uh, a few extra resources and a lot of expertise in other fields where you can apply some technology and some expertise very easily to the new product you're designing in your category. And I think it's just a level of detail that others may or may not go to in some of their products, you know. Fair enough. I noticed in one of your slides, Chris, I wrote down here, high-res audio. Mm -hmm. Now, I've said this. I've been vocal about this. I think high-res audio is a little bit ahead of its time. It's been out for a minute now. Um, but I feel like in very recently, uh, consumers are starting to pick it up. And I think it has a lot to do with availability of source material uh, and so on and so forth. I've seen other brands starting to make a bigger push towards that messaging that their um, you know, equipment is also high-res audio. But Sony has a, a, has a pretty interesting, unique story when it comes to high-res audio, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, we kind of pioneered this, excuse the term, but um, you know, when it came to putting high-res audio into a vehicle, uh, we, we set the bar pretty high with our RS GX, GSX-9. So like, listen, if you want to talk about being ahead of the curve, go back six, seven years, to the introduction of the RSX GS9. Uh, nobody, nobody even knew what it was and nobody cared, right? And the only, you know, high-res files were occasionally you'd come across one, but they were DSD files of, of music that was created 30, 40 years ago. That nobody right? wanted to listen to. That nobody wanted to listen mm -hmm. to. Right? So mm -hmm. there was, uh, talk about being ahead of the curve, like, wow, right? We, we totally just jumped the shark on that one. So uh, I think that, High res audio is a volatile subject, depending on who you're talking to in the industry, right? And I think it is currently being used as a marketing term by a lot of companies, right? Uh, I think there, there are some specifications and standards that Sony has been involved with, with writing uh, to create those standards to certify things at high res level, right? I think that high res and your experience with high res it's obviously going to be based on your source material and the components that you're using to reproduce them right uh those two things have equal parts in your audio system 
I think the other thing that is um, in high res audio that needs to be mentioned is, um, you know, can you hear that high? Uh, you know, can you hear above a certain frequency? You, you cannot hear 40 kilohertz. You can't hear 60 kilohertz. You can't hear 80 kilohertz, right? I think Sony's uh, theory behind designing the products that we do in the way that we do with the high res capability is this. Just like I mentioned earlier, what we have that inherent responsibility to reproduce music as the artist intended. Uh, we want to make sure you have the tools to reproduce that music as the artist intended in your vehicle or your home audio system or wherever it is. If we're cutting you short on the capabilities of the uh, equipment, then you don't stand a chance with reproducing it as the artist intended in, in some cases, right? Depending on the source material. So I think it's important that um, any consumer right? And thereby the retailers selling it have realistic expectations for high res audio. Okay. Um, I think that's super important to note. I think it's super important to understand, right? Uh, does high res music sound better? I mean, I've heard some really crazy sounding high res audio systems where the sound sounded better. Was it because of high res audio? I don't know. Mm. Right. Um, so, and I've heard some really high res audio, you know, systems that have been set up that did not sound good. Right. So I think that, you know, the sword cuts both ways on that. Keyword um, setup, think, keyword setup. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. listen, there's a lot that goes into setting up a good sounding audio system. I can mm -hmm. make a very plain set audio system sound really good. Right. Um, without any high res capability whatsoever, mm -hmm. but we want to provide the equipment that can allow you to do whatever you want with the music that you have. Okay. And I think that's the way we're approaching this and have approached it for a very long time. Uh, I have a car. We, we talked about this in the preamble uh, before the show. I have a car with over 500 horsepower. Do I need that? No. Right. Um, I mean, I need about 50 horsepower to get around town adequately. Right? <laughs> if that much. Yeah. If that much. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's on tap if I need it. And, and that's what makes you smile. So even you're right. smiling now, just Listen, saying that you have it. But the experience is there, right? And if right. I want to enjoy that, mm -hmm. or if I want to th like, listen, even just take it off from a red light fast, I'm not using 500 horsepower, right? In all cases, you know, it's just it's just not there, right? Mm -hmm. But is it there? Yes, for sure. It's measured. I can reproduce it anytime sure. I want. Um, and I think that having that capability uh, to be able to drive how I want when I want is the same as having a high res not restricted system. by your equipment yeah for mm -hmm. sure right so like i might want to go to 150 miles an hour in a honda elantra right but should i no can i probably not right and so i don't Ooh, want to be restricted. take a lot of work it would take a lot yeah, of work. yeah so i don't want to be restricted by the equipment that i've purchased and, fair enough, uh, fair enough. Of, you know i think that's just the way it boils down i got two more points for you chris and then i promise sure. that's it the, the second okay, uh, okay. i want to talk about the amplifiers for a second I find it was a very interesting design choice. You know, a, a, some of the trend that I've been seeing coming from amplifiers is going smaller. You know, oh, there's not enough room in the trunk. People don't want to sacrifice room. I'm not going to say that the Sony Mobile ES amplifiers are huge by today's standard. They're not, but they certainly aren't compact. And I'd like to hear what was a little bit of the, the decision making behind that. Yeah, I think this is um, simply, I'm going to get myself in trouble here. I think it's good engineering, right? I think we we have designed amplifiers that reproduce a lot of power mm -hmm. and can do it consistently anytime you need it. And they sound really good. And I think that you, it's like the old uh, good, fast, or cheap triangle. You know, you can have two of the three. And I think size was the victim here um, on reproducing these amplifiers, right? I or creating these amplifiers. I think that good and... Um, and powerful are two of those three things on that item. And small is the is the victim here, uh, but they're not big. I mean, these things no. are no bigger than our older GS amplifiers with more than twice the power. Uh, so, we, you know, in terms of the scalability of size, we have gotten a lot smaller in terms of the output. But the priority was the performance. The pr priority with us is always the sound quality and performance, mm -hmm. right? And you can see by the power specs and you can listen to the amplifiers they're pretty astounding. So, uh, you know, I would, I'm just going to rest, uh, you know, our products on those two traits. 
and don't get me wrong like i said be, to be clear they're not huge by any means they are no. compact that you know that five channels got everything you need and more in a small chassis um and lots of power to boot and, and i mean even the single mono channel is how much percentage of the the standalone mono would you say it was 50 so the five es is about 75 percent. 75 percent. so i yeah. mean you know for a five channel you're getting a lot of pounding for the you know power for this uh, the yeah. lower frequency 750 watts rms at two ohms so there you go that's there you go that's output. That definitely. All right. My final question. This is a fun one. This is a fun one. So let's say you're getting a new whip, you, Chris Bula, and let's say it happens to be a Cadillac Lyric, maybe. I don't know, something like that. <laughs> uh, if you had free reign to use Sony Mobile ES equipment to design a system for you, how would you, what was the system design look like? Oh, man. Ah, uh, geez. I don't know. I mean, I uh, I'm a big fan of not making my audio systems visible um you know like I've, I've got a cadillac now and i love it it's it's my favorite car i would use that over a lyric because i'm a gas guy right so <laughs> i haven't made the jump to electric yet but um even in that car the only thing you can see is the subs in the trunk and that's only if you open the trunk right mm -hmm. so it's uh, everything else in the car is hidden and i've got 30 speakers in there so you, you can't see a thing it's you maintained awesome. all 30 drivers yeah Oh, yep. wow. Okay. So it's pretty awesome to hear the, you know, hear and, and see or not see the sound system when you've got it. So if I were designing a, a, a system of my own, of course, I'd be using our mobile ES products. They're pretty awesome. Yeah, that's what I mean. With that, um, what would be yeah. the configuration? For sure. I mean, uh, you know, the, unfortunately, the, the victim in most new cars is the head unit, right? Because that's just not. So let's say you have a car that you could replace the head unit. Yeah. That would make it I mean, easier to answer. So yeah, 9,500 through, um, I would say probably a couple of the four ES amplifiers and a couple of the one ES amplifiers, right? I think the five ES is, is it's my favorite amp, uh, because it's such a compact chassis with the power output, mm -hmm. but, um, you get into some configuration issues if you're trying to put a couple of those in there. So I would go a couple or probably two or three of the four ES amplifiers and a couple of the one ES amplifiers. Well, compare yeah. notes. When I was looking at the, the product and the specs and all that, I would have probably went a two way up front, two tens in the back with two five channels, one running left side, one running right side bridged. Does that yeah. work? I mean, you could certainly do that for sure. Yeah. 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 That's me something I've been curious to do. This whole left right channel. I've seen a couple builds going that route. Never did it myself. So I'm definitely curious to see how that would work. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's not a problem. You could do that for sure. Um, I think I'd want more speakers um, just because I I just like overkill on speakers, right? So, Fair enough. Um, <laughs> 500 horsepower guy. Yeah, gotcha. <laughs> listen, that's it for me, man. I mean, listen, uh, brilliant job on everything. There's no question in my mind, this is not your average gear, right? This is why you're here. This is why, you know, you're, 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 you're talking about mobile ES, whether it's the source unit, the speakers, the amplifier, and who knows what else is coming down the pipe because I know I'm not even going to bother asking you. You're going to let me know whatever happens. <laughs> you so, know better, I'm right? Even I'm just saying whatever else comes down the pipe that might have a yellow square in the corner, I'm sure we'll find out when it's time, and uh, maybe we can talk about it then. But for now, so, you know, if your dealer out there, this is an interesting one because it's high end starting from the source unit. Think about that for a second. It makes it a unique proposition. On that note, uh, for anybody looking for information on Sony Mobile ES products, unfortunately, the, the URL is a little bit complicated. Go to Sony.com. It's not hard to find. Find the car audio stuff. It's got the whole light up, and then Mobile ES is within there. So that's off the Sony website. Of course, that could lead you down to Spider-Man as it could lead you down to Pro Audio. But type car audio, you'll find it. Uh, if you happen to be a dealer in Canada and you're like, yep, yeah, uh, I'd like more information on Sony Mobile ES. Get a hold of the folks at Gentech International, gentech-intl.com. I know my friends there are busy at SEMA this week, and uh, we wish them the best. Chris, on that note, thank you so much for coming in, talking to us about Sony Mobile ES. I appreciate the opportunity, Ben. Thanks a lot for, your, uh, for the audience here. I appreciate the support, and let's keep rocking. Sounds good. I'll see you soon, Chris. Take Thanks, care. Thanks, Ben. All right, I want to remind you, it's not over. We are deep into the audio file sessions here on CMA Networks. Each and every day, we are putting a focus on a different brand, some a brand that specializes or offers product in the high-end audio side of things. Check out that lineup each and every day. Tune in at 12 p.m. Eastern. Now, we've got a great contest, about two, three weeks left to sign up. So if you haven't, today should be the day. We're giving away two packages to attend the master tech expo in 2023 all you got to do is head over to cmanetworks.com slash giveaway to sign up for free today and while you're there 
Check out more interesting content or videos that I've done with Chris Bula and Sony. Check out Chris's own profile page on cmanetworks.com. It's where the 12-volt industry connects. That's it for the CMA Connected presented by SiriusXM. I'm your host, Ben Wu. Until next time, we connect. Yeah, roll it down. I am. You don't need a car to listen to Sirius XM. You can listen anywhere. You know that, right? What? Kevin Hart's last What? <laughs> Kevin, you could use your phone. What? What? Alexa, play Kevin Hart's Laugh Out Loud Radio on Sirius XM. What? This is how I know you're getting old. I guess that was it. What? <laughs>